Hey folks, Denzel here. De Denzel? Denzel Pencil? The the dazzling de I was originally gonna make one of these, one of those like traditional director's commentaries where I like put up the video and you know I talk through it and pause it every now and again and, and explain what's going on and all that fun stuff. The first couple of versions of it ended up being me just rambling like aimlessly for like an hour and a half. Very not fun to, to watch or listen to. Instead, I've written out a uh, an entire like talk through about the whole production for it. So I'm going to leave some skipping information just in the description or on screen or whatever so that you can skip to any part that you are most interested in. Uh, Cuz I don't expect you to watch the whole uh, what is this, 40 minute video. Anywho, let's get into it. The very beginning i just want to write out what's happening in the video but the script is actually just a bullet point list of all the actions and events that i want to happen just in point form super basic like character looks up and sees banner shock turns around to building just point form action to action descriptions from that i make notes of what assets i'll be needing uh, characters clothing items furniture buildings etc and i'll get to work uh, all the assets just come from the game files it's a bit of a loaded topic to try and like talk through them or like how to do it at least so i'll leave some links in the description for if you're curious about getting into that yourself i spent a bunch of time just sifting through the game files and then looking for uh, you know models and textures for things um, this is by far the most time consuming part since it's a wild goose chase the entire time but you know eventually i get what i'm looking for and then i can bring that into blender inside of blender we're importing cleaning up any problems that the models might have uh, setting up most of the textures, excluding the faces, because those tend to usually take a little bit more time to get right, and just basically preparing them as assets. Uh, I use an application called Prism, which is just a project manager. It lets me organize all the assets, renders, and shots all in one place, and takes care of the whole file structure and, and organization for the entire thing. And because of this, I'm able to more easily reuse stuff from previous videos. If I didn't have this, I probably like wouldn't have made this. Could you imagine trying to keep track of like 40 shots and like all the versions of the files and then all the renders for the... No thank you. I'm out of here. Once everything I think I need is in place, I swing my attention back over to rigs. Every model comes with a bone system and skin weaving already in place, but I find this to be absolutely useless to work with since it's not designed for Blender. Clean up the geo of all of its stuff and re-rig and reskin it from scratch. So in the case of Morning Turnips, we had four player rigs, Tommy, Daisy, and good old Mr. Nook. Uh, I do all the rigs with the Rigify add-on in Blender. I don't really know how to make good rigs, uh, but Rigify does and it just saves me a bunch of time because it can just generate stuff on the fly. The player rig is the easiest. I can just recycle the mask boy three times and just cycle out whatever clothes it's wearing. All the clothes though has to be sourced individually, which can be a bit frustrating. The geo for the clothes are in one place and the texture files for them usually lay in some other files somewhere else. Get it, set it, and we have a little dance. I also try to slightly improve them each time I get into these files. Uh, I find that replicating something like the hair, for example, is a bit of a struggle for me because the game just the game just makes it look so good and so hairy, so shiny, and I just can't seem to replicate that as well. So every time I come back from these rigs, I always take another stab at trying to figure it out. Tommy was pretty straightforward, though I had a bit of struggle trying to find his shirt textures. Uh, Nook was added in later in production, though I knew he wasn't going to be doing much, so I basically only rigged him up enough to just have him turn his head. Like, he can still bend his arms and do stuff, but like the turn was the focus. The hardest one actually out of them all was Daisy. I tried to challenge myself and see if I could set up dynamic animations for parts of her head. I wanted the, the turn up and the snot drop her hair and her ears and her bandana to flap and sway around in the wind um, whenever she moved. But as I was getting into it, I just I just couldn't get any of it to work. The solutions of dynamic bones were kind of limited as far as I could find, and getting them to work with with the Rigify systems as well was just not happening. Uh, I eventually just went down the cloth route and skin weighted the turnips and the bandana and um, regularly rigged her ears and her the little snot thing. Um, saved me from, from crying too much. Her hair was supposed to move as well, but I opted to just skip all that entirely and just never animate it. I bashed my head against the wall for this for like three days. You know, it is what it is. Tis art. Now in terms of technical stuff for shaders, I followed uh, this post on how to set up basically all the shaders or on how to connect the different textures together and, uh, and I just kind of tweak it as I go. The same principle is also what was, what was done with the face, but for the face specifically because the face is technically just a texture switcher um, shader that's 
that I animate for the eyes and mouth. Um, I follow these two tutorials on how to set that up. And yeah, that's basically prep. The whole process of this usually takes the most time, a couple days, three, four days maybe, to just get everything in file and ready to go. And once all this is finished, we move on to... Storyboarding is like sitting down and specifically drawing out all the frames and camera angles and what have you, and then editing that all into the editor, and then, you know, getting a feel of, uh, of the video, and it's cool. Though, personally for me, I find the aspect of drawing and editing those drawings together to be a bit of a waste of time. Don't get me wrong, I love to draw, but like, drawing frames that nicely depict action isn't really one of my strong suits. I'm a, I'm a layout artist by trade. So I instead just take the rigs and assets that I've already, that I do have made, or at least whatever work in progress versions of them, and just kind of stick them on, uh, stick them out in the scene, point cameras at them, and then take quick screenshots to, uh, to get things started. Uh, nothing crazy here, really. All I'm focusing on is just testing the rough structure of the video, kind of, kind of like I'm pitching it to myself in a way. I'm usually really messy with this step as well, doing all this in like a single blend file or like a single working file and just throwing the camera around and what have you. I'm not really too worried, or at least the, in this stage, I'm not too worried about pacing or composition. Um, I'm just looking to see if the video's idea as a whole can work. You know, if it doesn't, then no big deal. I can always just reuse assets that I've that I've made up to this point for something else. But if it does work, hot damn, we in the money, guys, yeah, let's go. So yeah, quick viewport images strung together is the first rough pass of the video. The step usually takes like a couple hours and if the Council of Mies approve, then we move on to stage two. And that's... So most of the prep's done, and I have an idea of the video to a degree. At least it tells me that, it, you know, it's doable. So now I need to actually create shots and do a proper, proper layout. In Prism, I'll create shots and sequences based off the frames in the storyboard, and within each shot, I'll just recreate what I've done on the board, but like, you know, with actual rigs and then a little bit of set blocking so I can have an idea of, of what I'll need to make later on. And usually in this step, I'm actually thinking about composition and framing and all that fun garbage. If a set was made in prep, then I'll populate it in. If not, I'll just put in the key geometry or some important set pieces and then just build a set around it later. The first couple shots actually were originally built and blocked on a live stream. What's a cute pink, guys? Put your hex codes in the, in the chat, <laughs> and, and I'll pick the best pink. Uh, but then, like, heavily reworked later when it came to rendering. More on that in the, in the lighting and rendering stage. Ooh, very cool. A skipping foreshadowing. I'll roughly block out the characters' positions and, like, key poses, and unless the camera is doing something, like, really specific, like a pullback from the ground, I'll usually just fully animate the camera while I'm doing the characters. It's usually not that hard, at least. I, that's what I tell myself. But it's also in this stage that I'm like more seriously thinking about composition and pacing and the timing of actions and stuff. And that's kind of how I do blocking. It's basically a more refined storyboard pass. And in Resolve, I'll make a new timeline to set it all together. And blocking usually ends up taking like, I don't know, a day, two days ish, maybe. I'm not very fast. Animation, let's go! So animation, at least to me, isn't the hardest part, surprisingly, though I do often dread it the most because it's one of the most scrutinized aspects of a video. But luckily, Animal Crossing is rather minimal in terms of how much fluidity happens in their motions. Most of the shots, if I did a good enough blocking pass, I can just flip to Bezier and like it pretty much animates itself. I just add hold keys and offsets between body parts and try to follow the uh, them animation principles, you, you, you squash and strip. I never really classify myself much as an animator. I'm a camera guy. I like, I like kind of camera things. I'm a really big fan of cinematography or the art of cinematography. So I try to set the shots up in ways so I have to do the least amount of animation. See, I'm a fraud. I don't know how to animate. I just pay future me. He just figures it out. He's, he's, the, he's the guy. Future Dangle. At the core of their motions, they aren't really doing much throughout most of the shots, um, but I try to add subtle bobs and motions by just adding and dialing in noise modifiers to their bodies. So much, so much is done with noise modifiers. Tommy is two keys with a bunch of noise modifiers. Daisy, all noise modifiers, except for her snot. I had to, had to hand animate that. I add it to all the characters to give them subtle, subtle sways and bobs while they stand and, and do, do their things. 
fun and punchy with all noise modifiers and uh, all the handheld camera motions with in any video is just more noise modifiers uh, this thing really saves lives and saves me a bunch of time and keeps me from needing to fine-tune doing doing human subtleties where things got real fun was was figuring out how to do the button mesh kind of animation uh, I hated the idea of having all the animation kind of on one timeline. I wanted to do actions in layers so that I could animate the core animation and then just add the button mash up over top of whatever they were doing. I thought for the longest while that Blender didn't have an alternative to like animation layers like it does in, in like say Maya for example, uh, but it does. The non-linear animation editor. Never knew how it worked, so I took the time to figure it out and uh, boy was I happy I did. Uh, it was a little confusing at first because it was causing some some weird stretching and like overcompensation problems, but I eventually figured out how to, how to stop that. You're supposed to add layers, not combine them, silly goose. God, amateur. So I animated their movements and then the switch over top of it. Learning the, the NLE actually helped immensely with later shots with the, uh, with the mask boy because I knew I wanted him to do like walking and stopping and turning around actions and stuff. And for someone who didn't believe in their abilities, it sounded really time consuming and hard. But with the NLE, I could do it in parts and just blend them together. You know, I could just make a run or walk separately and then, you know, his actual actions and what he's doing and just have them all blend together. Easy. I was really worried about the drowning sequence because it did require a lot of, a lot more work that I couldn't necessarily like do workarounds for. It was just straight making drowning animation. You just, you just gotta get into it. Um, there was the water and the thrashing and that all, you know, really scared me for some reason because I thought I wouldn't do it any justice. But when I really got into it, I just took it one step at a time, just make sure the blocking looked good enough for, um, for the next phase of it, turning it to smooth and just smoothing it out and making sure that all the poses and all the, and then their actions looked convincing and, uh, and motivated and then just making sure it all looks fluid enough so that you don't go, Ugh, that looks disgusting. Animation. It's fun. In terms of the water, I knew I didn't want to do any actual simulation because I thought that it would probably take way too long to do the sims and baking and, and all that stuff just to have, have it splashing around. So I opted just to have a plane driven by a displacement modifier animated to look all warbly. The intensity and the speed of it is connected to a controller that uh, I can animate to so just speed up or, you know, grow in for ferocity as the sequence progresses. and. Um, Actually, the same technique, which I originally learned from uh, the YouTuber Ducky3D, is what I actually use to do uh, any of the wind blowing effects for uh, the trees and the flowers as well. Um, link in the description if you want to learn that, it's pretty cool. But even in animation, the pacing and timing of everything still fluctuates. These shorts always start shorter than what the end result be usually becomes. And the more I work on it, you know, the more I need to make things longer so that shots can feel better or the pacing for things just sticks a little better if there are things can just so that it works. The phase of going from blocking to like fully animated usually takes like three, four days maybe. Again, depending on the shot and what it requires, some shots take longer than others, but generally a couple days. And that's 3D animating. Let's go. For all the 2D elements, they were actually pretty simple. I used a program called Affinity Designer uh, to build all of the elements in their pieces. And then those elements were brought into Adobe After Effects to be rebuilt and then animated in their entirety. And then that asset would be rendered out again and then imported back into Blender as a card or something. And then I would just place that wherever it needed to go. So, you know, in front of characters or in the sky or what have you. Yeah, it was just, just that. The destination board was recreated from scratch so that I could add this little parallax effect. And it was kind of annoying trying to get this image or get the reference for this because the only image that I could find was one from uh, from these two, the Morel twins. Because apparently every other YouTuber are just, nobody takes a picture of this, of this damn board. Tracking down reference for the little island was also kind of a, kind of a struggle. I only ended up finding like a single photo of it that was really low quality uh, that I had to go off of. Uh, now you might be wondering to yourself, why didn't you just, you know, go to your Switch and, and get at everything from there? Um, well, because that would have taken way longer than it would to just Google it. I guess I could mention the glitch shot as well. That was literally just, I take a frame of her while she's doing her pose. And then for like two frames, just add this glitch effect. I literally just watched a tutorial on how to make a glitch effect in After Effects because 
I don't know how to do that from scratch. What am I, some sort of artist? Garbage. Uh, and that's basically all the 2D stuff. Um, nothing super crazy. The most time consuming part was just figuring out what to have everybody say and then you know, and then making the destination board. That took forever. Yeah, people seem to dig it. So when all the animation is good, I move on to the lighting phase. This step is when I try to stop worrying about the animation and figure out a way to make each frame kind of look as pretty as I can get them. Uh, and that includes lighting, obviously, set reconstruction and tweaking, if need be, shader tweaking, that damn grass, and then rendering, of course. I'll get into rendering in its own little block. I'll usually tailor each shot to look good from the angles that we see them at. Uh, so I'm constantly tweaking and changing like the placements of things to keep the backgrounds both not distracting, but also st still kind of visually interesting. For lighting all the exterior shots, I was actually just using a single sky node in the scene, tweaking it from shot to shot so that the highlights weren't super hot. Um, like I literally put it in, audibly yelled, wow, and then called it done. The interior of the shop was actually still lit by the sun mostly because I wanted it to come through the windows. That illuminated most of the scene with some of the, with some extra lights representing ceiling fluorescent lights or whatever. Just some other stray ones here and there to like add some cool highlights to the characters because you know, ooh, I'm a lighter now. So cool. Um, give me an Oscar, but I have no lighter, so you know. Eh. Things got a little more tricky with with the drowning sequence because I was always running into this problem of the light objects showing up in the reflection on the ground, and I specifically didn't want that. I wanted to try to get go for that Stranger Things kind of like Black Abyss look, where like just the characters are lit from some strange out of frame light source, but nothing else is reflecting that light kind of. I also wanted to try to play with the volumetrics and to add like a subtle fog but then ended up just not looking or rendering great. And I specifically wanted one over top of Nook during uh, any time he was on screen, but that just, it just wasn't working super well. So I just opted to leave it out. The next big struggle was getting the water and the aerial shots to look good and then getting grass to look good. Uh, for the water, I knew I wanted to actually see like wave interaction or the water climbing up the beach, but um, I didn't want to do any simulations since I thought that would take too long. So I tried to figure out some shading approach to, to like making it, but I also couldn't get that to look that great either. There was a shader that an artist named Ben created with this like super sexy looking shader for waves that was made for the render engine Eevee. I was using cycles so I so it wouldn't necessarily come out looking the same. So I spent a bunch of time trying to get it to look as good as it does here, but on a larger scale on the beach. And like it kind of worked, but like, or I was able to get it like 80% of the way there, but it still looked really fake. It was intersecting with the beach kind of in this like very obvious way. Um, so I eventually just scrapped it and went with the, went with just doing the water with some noise modifiers and, and a fun transparency shader. And I just watched some more tutorials on how to make water shaders and called it a day. Same thing with the void water. I wanted like this this reflective but murky sort of sort of goop. Um, it ended up just mixing a couple different tutorials together to get the effect that I was looking for. And I thought I, I thought it came out pretty decent. Um, yeah. Then there was the, the there was this climbing wet effect on their bodies. I got the idea because another channel that I was following was giving away this free shader node that would add like wetness to objects. Um, but when I downloaded it and like put it in and tried it out it, just, it didn't work um at least i couldn't get it to work but i still wanted the effect so i just sat down and figured out my like my own solution to to doing that but i think it looked pretty good it even animates so, so as the water climbs the wet effect also slowly travels up the body as well so that was i thought that was pretty pretty cool the other big thing was to figure out the grass in previous videos the grass was just a particle system on a plane but the actual hair particles were replaced by uh, these like grass chunk models. They're basically just clumps of polygons or little triangles that were technically from the game, but but I always disliked the way they looked. I couldn't really animate it and in large fields, it just made everything look, you know, really cheap and cardboardy in my opinion. So with turnips, specifically with this shot, I looked at it and, um, and I was like, I can't keep using this, using these this grass thing. We're gonna, we're gonna do some grass from scratch. 
so I cracked open some more tutorials, as well as using good old weight paints for distribution, we got grass. Grass that sways in the wind. Grass that actually can be textured nicely. And for some shots, like the aerials, um, ended up costing me a lot longer render times. So I decided to just bite the bullet and take it because I wanted the extra detail. One of the problems I was having was the fact that the grass's distribution was based off of vertex painting, um, and I kept running into this problem where at the edges of where grass should be stopping, I was getting uh, lone rogue blades that would bleed into other textures and surfaces, as well as the fading out of grass distribution looking at, looking like a tiled pattern. It was uh, it was no fun. It was no no fun indeed. I tried to fix this by just upping the resolution of the ground plane um, so that I could paint cleaner edges. I guess, but that didn't really solve much, it just kind of made things go slower. Um, the solution I did end up going with would just be, was just make patches of geo that cut off where I wanted them to actually cut off, and then make those patches of geo have grass, have the grass particle system it, um, emit from it. I did that for some shots, but not others. So throughout the first sequence, the grass line is like constantly shifting. Big sad, but no one, no one notices, it's a background detail. Just to mention the, uh, the the trees and flowers, the grass and weeds, they're all done with the same hair scattering technique, which was which was real cool. Rendering, rendering, let's go. Rendering is always a mixed bag, at least for me. Uh, I try to be thorough with like with all the shots because I want to spend as little time waiting for renders as I can. So I'll go through each shot individually, dial in all the render settings so that they look as good as they can, but also not take forever to render. I've, everything was rendered inside of cycles uh, on a 3090. So shot lengths range from like 30 seconds to like a minute and a half or so per frame, which sounds super fast. You know, we're still talking, we're still looking at like an hour per, uh, to render like a 60 frame shot or what have you times that by like 40 shots and we're still looking at two straight days of rendering yeah we're, we're trying to cut that down to zero let's go but how do you organize your renders you may ask well the developer of prism the shot manager that i mentioned earlier also makes another program called pandora which is a render manager um this one lets me actually submit shots to a farm which is which is still just my one computer and like queue them up so that shots can render you know overnights or just on their own without me needing to be there to watch it you know it's a little it's a little render farm but the farm is a single computer pretty cool pretty cool i did that it's amazing but this brings some other fun troubleshooting issues to the table uh, like the fact that scenes don't necessarily translate 100 percent correctly through it so like i'll render a test frame in blender locally that'll look delicious but then when i send the whole sequence through it renders fine but some things in it might look a little different like objects might be missing or textures might not have the same um, brightness that i'm looking for some things come back different not a huge deal it can be a little bit frustrating uh, one of the problems i realized early on back in, back in Lolly's crafting was that if multiple textures share the same file name, then when Pandora picks it up, uh, it just takes the first texture and just applies it to everything. I rendered a couple shots overnight, only to come back to see that like half of Lolly and the rest of her room was all furniture shaped DIY recipe cards. So name your files, kids. Overall, rendering went relatively smoothly. I did have to do some re-renders here and there to fix things like shadow terminations on characters and bodies and uh, weird blur frames on Daisy's hat, and then also to render little sticker stamps or sticker fixes, this is what I, what I call them, um, to fix small details here and there that didn't render correctly. This includes things like, like this shot. <laughs> I forgot to toggle the cloth sim attribute for her hat, so it just rendered static floating there and her head just would pass through it. I literally just did a new sim, render or crop rendered that area of the screen and then just pasted that back over top. Uh, this shot, the water texture originally was like zooming across the um, across the water. So I just fixed that by well, fixing the texture speed and then just rendering the bottom half of the frame and then comping that back in in After Effects. When your boy walks into frame here, there was originally a, a skip and a step that actually had me shriek. I was super worried that I would have to redo his entire walking animation to fix it because I probably wouldn't have been able to get it to the sync with the already rendered frames. And uh, turns out that wasn't the case. It was just some weird interpolation problem with the uh, non-linear editor. 
and I could just hit a couple buttons and it, it ended up fixing itself and I could just re-render re that frame range and then just slap it over top. Easy. And lastly, our girl here was smiling at the end, so I just made her frown. So it was about three days to render everything. Two days were spent rendering most of the shots from beginning to end, um, and the third day was spent mainly just re-rendering little fixes and patches and new frames and stuff, like just all the fixes that broke during the first two days. Once all the rendering is done, and like out of the way, I can get into editing. I unfortunately didn't record any footage of me like editing together any of the sound work. So just like imagine a time-lapse footage of, of me sliding around little green blocks or like in DaVinci Resolve. In terms of like editing together the actual like clips, I'm not really doing anything at all really. Um, all the shots are rendered to the perfect frame range or frame length for them. So the actual editing process is just putting them in sequence together yeah nothing really that cool we did some color grading and stuff and like added a bunch of glares and the chromatic aberration which in hindsight looks kind of uh kind of crazy but that's done here so that i have some control over it uh, and that's kind of it for editing uh, the real fun is in the sound I sourced most of my sounds from Epidemic Sound and, and whatever sounds like I could save from the game files. Um, I actually managed to find some of the pings and the banner jingles. So I was able to just use those there without having to like record some weird version of it that EQ music out of. Any of the sounds that I couldn't find in a timely manner, I just recorded myself. Um, so. Things that you probably can't really hear, like clothes wrestling. Uh, the button mashing sound. And, uh, and the music. It was, all, it was all me, baby. Those are my hands slapping that xbox controller i also do a bunch of sound design tweaking i call it sound design but i'm basically just adding reverb to everything um, i love the idea of like all the music and sounds like being diegetic uh, meaning that like everything emits from an actual physical sound source in the space i guess um, i tried to make the island like the background island hour music uh, sound like it's coming out of like some distant speakers Um, same with the inside of the store, um, to make it sound kind of like the tune was coming out of like a PA system or something. I even went through the hassle of like adding some, some distortion to it to make it sound like it's coming, it's a recording coming from something else. The ping of the banner echoing over everything was something I really wanted to like get down. And in the void, there's, I tried to go for this like muffled sound effect kind of thing, like sound doesn't really travel that far in that space. But there wasn't really enough sounds going on in it to really like hear that kind of detail so yeah you, you know it's whatevs like i love doing doing sound stuff or like working with sound um i think it's really fun to tweak i don't think i like nailed anything necessarily but i'm still pretty happy with the result that came out the song i ended up doing on a stream one day like a day before i ended up finish, finishing the video and if you actually want to see that i can link the archive stream in the description so you can see me doing that live if you want she looks you in the eyes you realize you're in love and all you can hear is sustain trumpet baby yeah and that was kind of it uh, i put the music in and did some other tweaking but at some point i moved the last block 
I, I, I dialed the last slider and I just, I, I never touched it again. The video was done. The entirety of a Saturday was spent just exporting it and making sure that it looked good through, um, like on Twitter and on Reddit and YouTube or what have you, just to make sure that it still looked good after the compression of these websites had their way with the files. And then um, Sunday was all about releasing and getting it out in the storm, just, just getting, getting it out there. And that's how it was made. The whole process took around three weeks to put together from beginning to end. Like I finished Great Pietro, took a short, you know, half an hour break, and then, <laughs> and then started back up on this one. So yeah, I hope, uh, hope you liked it. Uh, there's more in the pipe, I guess, since these seem to be kind of popular, I suppose, or at least at the time of this recording it was. And could you imagine in like a week, this is gonna be irrelevant? Oh, couldn't be me. Anywho, welcome to the end of the video. Uh, thanks for watching. Wow, that's that's crazy. Uh, you learned how the video was made. That's pretty cool. Well, I, I guess since you're here, I can give you some fun trivia of, of you know, the bork ups and and stuff. Um, I, I wrote I wrote a list. Don't worry. Like with this shot. I was super worried about doing proper composition and like, you know, proper rule of thirds and all that stuff. And I didn't realize that throughout this sequence that I crossed the 180 line like the entire time. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, this shot here establishes Kev on the left side of frame and Tommy on the right. But when we cut, it just flips. Now Kev is on the right and Tommy is on the left. And then it just it flips back and forth throughout those couple shots. I originally did it because I thought it would make the text easier to read. And then after rendering it and like looking at it back in the render, I was like, oh no, that's that's technically illegal. Oh well. <laughs> uh, the grass line keeps shifting around sh from shot to shot. I think I already mentioned that actually earlier in the thing. Yeah, I probably did. Uh, the island is actually just the airport and the shop. <laughs> I thought making more of it um, would, would be a good idea, but like later decided not to, just to save time. Because it, it would just be for this one-off, you know, gets covered by a banner anyways. The island is just the shop in the airport. Then even look over here, the path just stops. It's just, where does that, where does it go? It doesn't go anywhere. If you freeze frame, the players are playing human crossing on their switches. Whatever Tommy says, straight facts. Get Nintendo, come on. This shot of Susie going underwater was actually the one that was repurposed to make the KK, the in-between um, cover art. I just opened the shot and like reposed her and then uh, moved the light somewhere and then <laughs> made that. Uh, and I guess lastly, um, the island flag for this is a picture of, of Joe Rogan. Bet you didn't think Susie was a fan of uh, the Joe Rogan experience. Well, now you know. That, that's it. I have nothing else to offer you right now. You could, you could help me, you could support me on Patreon if you want. That's pretty cool. Subscribe to the main channel, we got more in the pipe. And stay groovy, my my sweet little baboos. My sweet little, sweet little babushkas. <laughs> anyway, see ya.